2019. He received the NAS Gulf Research Program's Early Career Research Fellowship in 2023 and NSF Career Award in, 19, in 2024. His research interests include power system operations, control and planning, microgrid optimal sizing and energy management, and applied machine learning and optimization. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for your time this morning. And uh, it's a great honor to have you as part of the webinar series at UND. And uh, you have about 45 minutes uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, to talk, and maybe we'll take Q&A after that. Uh, thank you so much. It's your time to share your screen. OK, let me go ahead and share. Thanks so much, Prakash, for the kind of introduction. Appreciate, uh, also appreciate the invite. Uh, let me uh, share my screen. Okay. Um, let me open my slide. Do you all see my slides? No. Oh yeah, now I can see something. Yeah, I think can you? Yeah, I think it's good. Uh, okay, I'm showing my first slide. You can you can see my first slide. Yes, we're good. Okay, awesome. I'm all I'm also having a technical issue with Zoom. It asked me to, to update the Zoom, uh, so I'm <laughs> using the browser. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, all right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, you know, uh, uh, thank you for having me here. So the the title for my presentation is. Uh, machine learning aided inertial constraint data had energy scheduling. Uh, so I'll first uh, give a quick introduction to power systems, then I'll briefly explain uh, power system frequency and the inertia, uh, then I'll jump ahead to the, the main uh, idea of this presentation, machine learning aided inertial constraint energy scheduling. Uh, then I'll talk about some strategies to enhance the computational uh, efficiency so that we can uh, ensure we can solve the proposed inertial constraint uh, and scheduling problem in a timely manner. Uh, finally, I'll draw the conclusion at the end. So as you all know, a power system is an electrical network of interconnected elements that are used to generate, transmit, and consume electric power. It contains various types of elements you know, uh, there are many different types of elements and for each type of those elements, there are like hundreds or even thousands uh, of them. Okay, uh, so power system is a you know, very large uh, physical uh, system uh, and the power system management uh, is very complex. So when we you know, uh, operate and manage uh, the power grid, uh, we, we often need to divide it into uh, different uh, so management problems based on time scales. Uh, if, no, if we look ahead like uh, 20, 30 years, it, it will be related to uh, power system expansion planning. Um, for our today's folks, uh, um, you know, we'll talk about a day ahead of scheduling. Okay. Uh, so power system data had a schedule is to uh, determine the on-off status of synchronous generators for different hours in the next operating day uh, so that the scheduled uh, solutions can meet the forecasted loads and other uh, physical and reliability constraints uh, such that the total cost is minimized. And also, uh, you know, power system is a physical system. There are many uh, restrictions, physical res uh, restrictions, and also reliability requirements. Uh, but we can always find, uh, in most cases, we can always find uh, a lot of uh, feasible solutions. So among those feasible solutions, we want to uh, pick the one with the least cost so that we can ensure uh, power system operational efficiency. Uh, how do we achieve that? Uh, we need to uh, you know, uh, uh, formulate and uh, solve uh, an optimization problem, which is named as security constrained unit commitment. Uh, mathematically, uh, uh, SAUC is a mixed integer linear programming model. Uh, the integer uh, variables, uh, there are many binary variables that are used to denote the on-off status of each generating unit. 
on this slide, I just show you a very uh, basic uh, version of asset IC, IC using model. So we try to minimize the total cost, and uh, it, it it is subject to you know, uh, you know different uh, system restrictions uh, plus reliability constraints. Okay, this is just a basic model for for practice. I say using model uh, it, it is much longer, much more complex. Uh, but you know, at least you can have an idea what the uh, say using model you know, would look like. Okay. Uh, power system frequency. Uh, so you know, uh, for modern power systems, there are AC systems, right? So we have uh, AC power sources, which are uh, synchronous generators. Synchronous generators, they rotate to uh, generate electricity. And uh, how fast they rotate, uh, that is equivalent to uh, power system frequency. And also generators, they are designed to work within a very narrow range of frequency. If the frequency is too high or too low, the protective equipment, uh, the protection system will, will kick in and trip the generator. That will affect the power system you know, uh, supply demand balance. Okay, so uh, maintaining power system, system frequency is essentially uh, you know, a supply demand balance problem. If we have over generation, the frequency will increase. But if we are uh, having insufficient generations, the frequency will decrease. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, you know, frequency stability is very important. Uh, but there are some uh, emerging challenges uh, that would affect frequency stability. Let me elaborate uh, quickly on the last few slides. Uh, as you all know, we you know today we have a lot of uh, renewable energy uh, in the power grid, uh, mainly uh, solar and wind power. So you can so this uh, figure shows the U.S. electric uh, electricity generation from renewable energy sources in the past uh, seventy years. Like before 1980, uh, almost all renewable energy, they are hydropower. But uh, uh, roughly starting from 2000, uh, I should uh, zoom in figure. So roughly starting from 2000, you can see uh, wind power is growing extremely fast. And also roughly starting from 2010, uh, solar power you know, starts growing very fast. Uh, and the, the trend is still ongoing. So we will know there will be a lot more uh, electricity generated from uh, solar farms and wind farms. Okay, uh, so that is uh, the main main change to our uh, power grids today. Uh, but this change will this change will help uh, you know, uh, provide more uh, green uh, electricity, but they also bring a lot of grand challenges. Uh, one challenge is uncertainty. Uh, because wind and solar power generation, they are uh, largely dependent on the ambient weather conditions, right? So they are variable, uh, intermittent, and uh, we cannot do a perfect uh, forecasting job. So that is an uncertain challenge. Uh, a, another a major challenge is related to stability, low inertia. So, uh, you know, you can see this diagram here, right? So tr this is a traditional synchronous generators. They are very large and heavy. They rotate to provide electricity. So they can provide a lot of uh, kinetic energy. Uh, that's what I meant by inertia, power system inertia. So power system inertia is very important to, to regulate uh, system frequency of uh, uh, following a large disturbance, especially the first to second. Um, but you know, nowadays we have more solar and uh, solar power and wind power in the grid. Uh, for you know, physically the the solar power they don't have any moving part, so they cannot provide uh, any physical inertia. Uh, for wind turbines, although they they also rotate to provide uh, electricity, but uh, they are much uh, light uh, much light, light uh, relatively. They, they, can, they provide a, uh, much less inertia compared to synchronous generators. Uh, so when, when a power system has much more solar wind power, then we will definitely uh, have much less uh, electricity from traditional generators. 
So this will lead to uh, you know, reduce the process inertia. And this uh, phenomenon will affect uh, uh, power system dynamics and the stability in a negative manner. And this challenge has been uh, much less studied. Uh, so this you know, this plant is you know is provide a solution to address this low inertia uh, challenge. Okay. Um, so this you know this challenge uh, would affect you know different uh, categories of power system stability. Uh, in our presentation, we will focus on frequency stability. Um, so I I will explain what would happen if. Uh, you know, what would happen after if uh, there is a large disturbance. Okay, so you can see this is a frequency response curve. Uh, in the United States, the nominal frequency is 60 hertz. Um, so, you know, it deviates, uh, it may deviate uh, from the nominal frequency 60 hertz uh, by a very small amount, a uh, very small amount. Uh, like 0 0.01, 0 0.02, right? So, but if there is a, a large disturbance, such as the loss of a large generator, then the, the frequency will drop very fast. So you can see like there is almost like a step down uh, for this curve. So the frequency will drop very fast and the uh, drop, uh, and also it will drop by a large amount. Uh, so if it drops too fast or drop too much, then uh, it uh, the pro, uh, the protective uh, uh, system will trip the generator, which will further you know uh, uh, worsen the system uh, generating in inefficiencies, uh, insufficiencies. Okay, so so the, the there are some requirements. We don't want the frequency drops too fast. We also don't want the frequency drops too much. So. Uh, power system engineers developed two metrics. One is nadir, the lowest point uh, on this frequency response curve. Another metric is uh, the slope of this curve, which is referred to the rate of change of frequency. Uh, so when we care about uh, you know, fre uh, frequency uh, stability in the data header and the scheduling uh, process, uh, so for the traditional power system, uh, the data had energy scheduling uh, never considered you know, such inertia constraints uh, because the traditional power grid has you know, like little uh, solar wind power, has a lot of synchronous generators. So you know, the traditional power grids, they are like a strong grids. Uh, but uh, you know, things have changed. Uh, we have you know, uh, much more solar wind power and we will have more solar wind power in the future. Uh, so the grid isn't as strong as, bef uh, as before, so we need to uh, capture the impact of you know, such low inertia challenge when we uh, do the ahead and the schedule. Okay. Uh, okay, all right. So next I'll talk about how we can uh, model inertia related constraints and how we can integrate such constraints into uh, the day ahead and the scheduling model, which is SAC. Okay. Uh, so, how do we uh, you know, uh, solve uh, power system stability constraints? Like, uh, if we go back, how do we obtain uh, you know, such uh, uh, time domain simulation curve? Uh, mathematically, I'll say we have some exact uh, uh, methods which is to solve uh, a large set of differential uh, algebraic equations. So, you know, if we solve such DE uh, uh, system, we'll be able to obtain the exact uh, dynamic response curve, uh, including frequency response curve. So that, that's the exact solution. Uh, but uh, this process is very uh, complicated and it is time consuming. Uh, we, uh, and this is DE, right? And for data had energy scheduling, it is uh, an optimization problem. Right? Uh, you know, if we integrate, if we want to uh, uh, integrate uh, you know, a large set of DE uh, equations into the optimization problem, 
uh, it will just make the optimization problem uh, unsolvable. Uh, so it's not a practical. So we need to make some uh, approximations. Uh, no, we need to make uh, approximations to simulate such uh, system dynamic performance when we, if we want to uh, consider some dynamic constraints when we do the uh, you know, day height and the scheduling. Uh, there are some uh, existing methods. For instance, we have system equivalent model based rock curve constraint SUC. Uh, this is a benchmark model in, in this presentation. So this model will uh, approximate the, the, the system-wide average uh, frequency performance. Uh, then we, we add these constraints uh, in the SUC problem. Uh, another uh, uh, existing solution, uh, which is our prior work, uh, we developed a, a formula that can approximate the, the rock curve uh, at each bus. So uh, I'll show some uh, results we have. So this is from the, the, the first benchmark model. So you can see, um, so there are mu uh, multiple uh, curves here uh, because we, here we plotted the frequency at different locations, different buses. Uh, and the, in a, in a dynamic state, the frequency response is that different for different locations. So uh, the average uh, frequency response, it can meet the pre-specified uh, limit, 0.5 frames per second. Uh, but if you look at individual uh, um, uh, frequency, uh, individual uh, bus, uh, uh, some, for some buses, uh, they violate the pre-specified limit uh, for for the other model, uh, you, know, you can tell uh, for all buses, uh, the frequency does not uh, uh, violate the pre-specified limit, but the solution uh, is conservative, which means we can first improve the, the system performance uh, while still meeting the stability requirements. Uh, so we propose a machine learning based solution uh, and this is an uh, 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 overview of our method. Uh, so you know, first, we, we run dynamic uh, time domain simulation uh, so that we can collect a lot of uh, data samples. And then we'll need to label each sample. Uh, for instance, uh, for each time domain simulation, we'll need to look at uh, the maximum raw curve or the uh, lowest nadir. Uh, then with you know, uh, 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 sufficient data samples, we'll be able to train a machine learning model. Uh, then, we'll just, then we'll integrate this machine learning model. So this machine learning model, it will serve as an uh, approximate uh, no, uh, uh, formula uh, to represent the system frequency stability performance metrics. Right? Um, also, it can, you know, it can be considered as an approximation to uh, the exact DE, uh, DE representations. Then we integrate this machine learning model into uh, the data height and scheduling, scheduling model. That's how we created a machine learning based uh, dynamics constraint unit commitment model. Then we solve this uh, machine learning integrated uh, unit commitment model. Uh, of course, uh, this model is much more complicated compared to the traditional SAUC, uh, but at least we can, uh, you know, uh, we, at least we, are, we, uh, we, now we are able to, uh, to model the dynamic performance when we do the day ahead energy scheduling, at least we'll uh, be able to develop uh, some additional computational enhancement uh, schemes so that we can solve the problem. Okay. Uh, next on the next slide, I will explain uh, with some details. Uh, so this is uh, the data generation process. Uh, so we generated roughly uh, um, ten thousand uh, samples. Basically, we we uh, we use this commercial software to to collect the data. We run roughly ten thousand time domain simulations. Uh, we we 
for we, we generate random uh, load profiles, uh, generate uh, you know, different uh, unit uh, commitment uh, combinations, different generated uh, scheduling solutions. Uh, then, then we run uh, you know, time domain simulations. Then we'll, we'll uh, label each data samples. Uh, we, you know, we, we, we can create a label for rocker rate of change of frequency. We can also cre uh, create additional labels such as frequency nadir. Okay. Uh, you no. Know, once we have uh, collected sufficient data samples, uh, we can you know, uh, develop a machine learning model. We can train it. Uh, in this, uh, on this slide, you can see it's a very uh, it's very straightforward machine learning model, uh, multi layer perceptron. Uh, it has some other names, but they, they mean the same thing. Also, you can say it's a fully connected uh, uh, neural network. We just have a few dense layers, uh, one output layer. Uh, if, so this is the, the, the prediction accuracy performance on a different uh, data set. So if we allow 5% error tolerance, we can achieve a prediction accuracy of 93.6%. Uh, if we you know, allow 10% uh, uh, error tolerance, then the accuracy is like almost 100%. So uh, you know, this model is, has very high uh, uh, prediction uh, uh, performance, uh, but you no, know, because we are process engineers, so we also want to see when we uh, apply this machine learning model along with uh, the data had energy scheduling model. We want to see how it performs uh, uh, in a physical uh, power system setting. Okay, uh, but how? Uh, uh, before the before I show you some results, uh, there is another challenge. So we have a machine learning model, right? Then how can we incorporate this machine learning model into the uh, the optimization model, the security constraint unit commitment model? Uh, the answer is, is not, uh, you know, it's pretty straightforward, I would say. Uh, so we can, you know, do some piecewise linearization to this machine learning model, but uh, we'll need, uh, we just need to introduce some binary variables to, uh, to represent uh, the nonlinearity of the machine learning model. Uh, so this is how, uh, what it looks like after the, the exact piecewise linearization. So, uh, so you can see it's a set of equations. Uh, then we will you know, uh, include, or say we'll uh, integrate, add these uh, constraints equations uh, into uh, uh, a traditional SUC model. So we'll uh, create uh, dynamics constrained, or say inertia constrained unit commitment model. Okay. Uh, then we can you know, solve such uh, machine learning integrated uh, data head energy scheduling problem. Uh, we we solve you know, we, we solve the unit commitment optimization problem. We will get the uh, generated commitment uh, status as as well as the generated output power. Right. We use that as the initial condition uh, for 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 the subsequent time domain simulation. You know, to in order in order to validate the the, the model quality, um, so the pre-specified uh, uh, frequency stability metric rocker the we, we still set it as a, a 0.5 hertz per second. Uh, so these are the three models. The first two are the benchmark models. The first two they are uh, physics-based uh, models. The third uh, is the machine learning uh, assisted uh, model. So you can tell uh, for the two benchmark models, one is one values the stability, uh, frequency stability uh, limit. Uh, the, the second is, uh, is conservative, but the machine learning uh, aided model, uh, the performance, uh, you know, it, uh, it's, is very promising. So you can see uh, the rocker you know, following the 
the lat the uh, the loss of the largest generator uh, is very close to the pre-specified tolerance, which means it can meet the stability requirement, but in the meanwhile, it's not a conservative. Uh, so I show you the comparison of the you know, time domain simulation results uh, with the solution from those three different models respectively on the same slide. So this dotted line is the pre-specified uh, limit, uh, 0.5 frames per second. Uh, so, and also there are multiple curves. Each curve represents a bus. So you can tell a generated bus. So you can tell for the first benchmark models, there are some violations. For the second model, there's no violation, but there there's still some room we can improve the system efficiency, right? Uh, and for the third, uh, you know, machine learning edit models, uh, we can go, you know, we can obtain the perfect solutions. Okay, it's very very promising the solution, uh, but of course, you know, nothing is perfect. Uh, it's the solution quality is very high. Uh, but the challenge is related, it related to computational uh, complexity uh, because uh, the the traditional data had any scheduling problem itself is all, is already very complicated. Uh, now we we uh, we make it much more complex by uh, by uh, integrating a machine learning model. Um, so it it becomes very very slow to to solve. Uh, so we did some uh, some work to, uh, uh, to improve the computational efficiency. Uh, so we have investigated uh, four strategies to improve the uh, computational efficiency. Uh, one is ReLU linearization. Uh, second is to develop a sparse uh, machine learning model. So the, these two strategies is to reduce the complexity of the machine learning model, or we can say we the, these two strategies is to uh, they are to um, reduce the size of the machine learning model. Okay, uh, the third strategy we uh, no we we uh, we try we, the third strategy is to determine the generator uh, commitment uh, status. Uh, before we solve, uh, before we start uh, solving uh, the uh, unit commitment problem, and the the last strategy is to determine uh, a minimum uh, set of uh, monitor lines. Uh, this is also before solving the SAUC problem. Okay, so mathematically, the third strategy is to reduce the optimization uh, problem variables. The fourth strategy is to uh, to reduce uh, constraints. Okay. We just try to remove unnecessary constraints so that we can uh, reduce the size of the unit commitment uh, problem. Okay, I'll, I'll quickly walk you through these four strategies. Um, so in the machine learning model, we uh, in our work we we pick the uh, ReLU as the nonlinear. Uh, activation function, it's pretty straightforward. You see, if it's negative, we, we set the post activated value as zero. Otherwise, if, if it's positive, we just use the positive value, the same value. Um, okay, so this is a nonlinear uh, ReLU function we, we use in the machine learning model, in our machine learning model. Uh, so we can do some approximation. So this is, this is nonlinear. Uh, one approximation we can do is we can find the lower bounds of all the uh, pre-activated pre values and also all the upper bounds of the pre-activated values. Uh, then we create a triangle to replace the ReLU. So with this triangle, we just need three, uh, linear, uh, three linear equations. Okay, so everything is linear. Uh, we don't need any binary variables. Okay, so this is an, uh, an approximation. Um, okay, we, you know, for for neural network, there are a lot of uh, neurons, and so we have a lot of uh, ReLU functions for uh, one ReLU function for one neuron. Uh, if we replace the ReLU function with all uh, with this uh, you know, set of linear uh, constraints, uh, it, it actually it doesn't work. It doesn't work. 
because the approximation error is, is extremely high. Uh, what we did is we, uh, we uh, selectively pick a subset of uh, neurons uh, and for the selected neurons, we do uh, such approximations. For the remaining neurons, we, we still use the exact reformulation with the additional binary variables. Okay, so uh, no, we, we, we call it a selectively linearized neural network. Uh, and you can see the, the performance. Uh, so this is DNA, so the, the model I explained in the previous section. So it still achieve uh, like perfect uh, frequency stability performance metric. Uh, and also when we do, uh, when we use this uh, approximation, uh, introduced here to uh, for a subset of uh, selected uh, neurons, we still achieve a pretty good, uh, also very, uh, you know, almost uh, perfect uh, performance solution. Um, but you, know, you can see we uh, we can improve the computational efficiency a lot. Uh, so this is a uh, so this column is a computing time. The first one is t means the traditional uh, the traditional SAT model. It's very fast, just uh, like uh, thirteen point six seconds. And also, when we have a machine learning embed, uh, machine learning integrated uh, dynamics constrained UC model, uh, it now takes uh, three hundred seventy seconds. You know, it uh, the computing time has increased by a factor of like twenty, you know, uh, twenty five. Um, and uh, with our you know, strategy, we can reduce the computing time by uh, like uh, 70, 80 uh, percent. This is the first strategy. Second uh, strategy is to develop, uh, uh, to, you know, to adopt a sparse technology so that we can uh, minimize the size of the trained machine learning model. Okay. So, so this is a dense uh, machine learning model, dense neural network. Um, but you know, different uh, connections they may have different impacts. For those connections with uh, you know, uh, negligible impacts, we can remove them. We can remove them, and then we just uh, use a, a, a reduced neural network, or say a sparse neural network. We can ret ret retrain it. We may still be able to achieve the same uh, prediction accuracy. Okay, and also with, uh, when we apply the sparse neural network, we can further improve the, the computing performance uh, and also the physical system performance, it, it retains. So you can see uh, we can still achieve uh, you know, almost perfect uh, frequency stability performance. Okay, the third strategy is to uh, predetermine the generator uh, status. Uh, this is also a machine learning. Uh, this is a, also a machine learning uh, uh, based uh, uh, method. But this machine learning model is different from the the previous machine learning model I explained. So the the previous uh, machine learning model uh, I explained it, uh, that machine learning model is to uh, you know, that machine learning model is to simulate the frequency uh, stability performance. So we have uh, the first machine learning model is to predict uh, the uh, two uh, frequency performance metrics, the raw curve and the frequency nadir. Okay, but uh, here we uh, here we train a different machine learning model. This machine learning models uh, it uh, it uh, it predicts uh, different things. It predicts the uh, generated uh, commitment status. Okay, uh, so. So uh, this machine learning model, uh, it it you know, it can uh, predict the generator on off status for all the generators for all the uh, you know, hours in the next operating day. Uh, but if we adopt all of those machine learning predictions, uh, it it will just make the problem infeasible. So it uh, because the machine learning model is not perfect, right? There are always uh, some prediction errors. Uh, so we cannot you know, 100% trust the machine learning prediction. So what we did is we uh, selectively, we, uh, we pick uh, 
uh, a subset of the machine learning predictions, uh, then we we you know we can determine a subset of binary variables representing the generated of status. Okay, uh, there will be also some additional uh, layer stages in between to verify the the selected subset of uh, machine learning predictions are va uh, are valid, physically valid for the uh, for the power grid. Uh, so with this strategy. Uh, you know, we can reduce the, the number of binary variables so that we can reduce the problem size. Uh, this is some uh, so, uh, results uh, for, uh, with this strategy. Uh, the first uh, uh, figure shows the, it shows the normalized uh, uh, cost. Okay, it's normalized uh, upon the, the traditional ICUC ob uh, objective function. Um, so we, we, we try, try this strategy on uh, five different systems, you know, uh, start from a small system, 24 bar system, uh, and, we, we, uh, uh, and also a large system like the Polish uh, system with over 2,000 buses. Um, so you can see, uh, the objective values, they are all around 100%. Okay? Uh, that means the solution quality does not change. Um, but if you look at the second diagram, it shows the normalized computing time. Uh, so you can see uh, for, for the largest system we tested, we were able to reduce the computing time uh, to, uh, down to 14.6%. Uh, um, okay, uh, so th this work we haven't tried it on the inertia constraint unit commitment. So this is uh, for uh, for regular uh, uh, unit commitment problem. Okay, uh, the last strategy is to predict uh, which lines, you know, uh, which electrical uh, transmission lines could it be. Uh, could cause congestions, uh, and for those lines, so we we believe they they will never uh, they won't be overloaded, so we don't need to include those lines in the model, so that we can reduce the number of constraints. Um, again, this is a, a, a third machine learning model, you know, a third a different machine learning model. Um, the input features you know could be the same, but the output will be different for this machine learning model. The output is the uh, the uh, the line classification uh, results. It's a it's binary uh, classification, either one or zero, because we would just want to know whether the the, the line uh, uh, is congested or would be congested or not. If the answer is no, then we don't need to uh, include this line in the optimization model. The answer is yes, then we need to monitor this line and add this, uh, you know, the, the line flow uh, limit constraints in the uh, uh, model. Yeah, we try some uh, uh, different machine learning models. Uh, graph neural network uh, uh, outperformed the other two. Uh, again, this, this, this work also hadn't considered the inertia constraint uh, uh, inertia requirements, um, but our you know, ongoing work is uh, is to uh, uh, to apply it on inertia constraint unit commitment the problem for their head scheduling. Uh, we are also trying to apply the same strategy uh, for real time uh, um, for real time uh, generation redispatch uh, applications. Okay. Uh, this slide shows shows a, a, a combined strategy you know, that this it combines the the, the the third and the fourth uh, strategies. So we do we try to reduce both variables and the constraints. Okay. Uh, so when we try both, it's, uh, uh, we can still obtain uh, one good results while reducing the computing time uh, a lot. Okay, uh, now jump to uh, draw the conclusion. Um, first one, uh, high penetration of renewable energy 
substantially has substantially reduced the power system inertia and uh, negatively affect power system frequency stability. Um, so this change, uh, this change in power grids uh, highlights the need of uh, you know, uh, secure uh, sufficient process on inertia. Okay, uh, and also uh, for this presentation, we we try to secure enough uh, grid inertia in the day ahead energy scattering. Uh, you may you may wonder uh, frequency st uh, you know, stability is a you know is a real time. Uh, uh, application it's really more related to real time, but uh, while we you know, uh, consider inertia related constraints when we do the day ahead of scheduling, uh, one uh, the answer would be uh, the generator status they cannot change immediately. Uh, it take, takes hours to to change the generator status, uh, so it's very uh, you know it's needed to to consider inertia constraints when we do the day ahead of scheduling so that. Uh, it won't be you know, way too late to uh, ensure we have sufficient inertia in real time. Okay, um, okay so uh, enforcing inertia uh, constraints in the day had uh, and scheduling model can uh, enhance power system stability, uh, particularly uh, frequency stability in this study. Uh, and also the machine learning uh, aided solutions, they are they can have a much better uh, performance, but they are much slower. Uh, so we may need to develop strategies to accelerate the, the solving process. Um, some, some future work, ongoing work is to, uh, you know, uh, is to consider virtual inertia. So right now all this work uh, uh, of this, our, our prior work, we, we only focus on uh, the physical uh, connect, uh, rotating inertia, um, but uh, with proper control, uh, you know, inverter-based resources, they can pr uh, provide uh, virtual inertia that can also help enhance the frequency stability. Um, so so we, we need to, to capture the, uh, the impact of virtual inertia. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lee, for your presentation. I appreciate uh, for uh, sharing your um, research uh, findings. Uh, we'll open up for Q&As and uh, let the Q&A comes. Jameson can coordinate, but I think I'm going to ask a couple of questions first. You know, mm -hmm. um, And uh, OK, so we understand from the day ahead scheduling point of view, uh, you talked about this uh, rate of ch change of frequency, how far you can able to make uh, stabilize the grid within that uh, point four or uh, with your uh, proposed approach, how do you see the dynamics is changing in real time, and how can we, um, how you know, wh how do we actually see the future work by translating or taking this type of work from the day ahead scheduling to, you know, real time? You know, even though that's uh, I understand mm -hmm. that the challenges there, but could you talk about a uh, few challenges as uh, as a boilerplate for uh, students who are listening uh, for them to uh, think about? Yeah, this is very, very a good question. Uh, so this work we focused on day ahead scheduling application, but uh, uh, another uh, major application in the power system industry is the real time uh, control, real time operation. Right. So how can we uh, you know, uh, leverage this work to enhance dynamic performance uh, in real time? Uh, so. I would say we can still adopt a very similar procedure. We can still adopt this machine learning uh, aided uh, approach, uh, but but uh, uh, for real time operation, right? Uh, uh, we have we we have much more accurate uh, information regarding the grid condition. When we do the day ahead and scaling, we 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 actually we don't uh, have uh, we don't know the real-time grid condition, but for real-time applications, we have that information. We can uh, leverage that in information so that we can better uh, the machine, the trained machine learning model. Uh, for instance, uh, we can consider reactive power, uh, we can consider voltage, local voltage uh, magnitude information as additional input features for the machine learning model. 
uh, you know, if we have uh, additional uh, input features, we will be able to improve the, the machine learning performance. Um, yeah. The second question I have is, you know, you talked about uh, you have a computational runtime is being very faster. You know, what is the grid size that you considered in your um, that finding that you talked about? And then, uh, um, you know, do you expect that um, that is going to uh, scale, provide or similar um, computational runtime as it scales into logic grid? You know, it's a kind of a yeah. loaded question there. Yeah. Yeah, this this is another awesome question. Um, so I sh show sh yeah show you this table. Um, so so this work is on a small system, just twenty four bus system. Even for this uh, small system, uh, compared to the the traditional SUC model, right? When we uh, solve the machine learning integrated UC model, the computing time has increased by a factor of uh, twenty or thirty. Uh, uh, if we uh, go for a larger system, it will, I, I, I believe it will be much uh, slower for this machine learning integrated system. Uh, so this is a big challenge to adopt this uh, uh, strategy, this solution uh, for the real power industry. Uh, so definitely we will need to uh, work more on, on this. Um, so. Again, you know, as I mentioned, we, uh, there are a few strategies we can improve the, the performance. Uh, we uh, basically two two categories of strategies. One is we try to uh, reduce the complexity of the trained machine learning model. The other is just to reduce the complexity of the unit commitment problem itself. Um, so if we can do well, uh, maybe it will work for a larger system. Uh, or if we, or if we, uh, or if we, when we, uh, you know, when grid operators operate their specific system, they have much uh, better knowledge for their own system, so they know uh, which part of their system is the weak part. We need to pay more attention. Maybe we just need to train a machine learning model to just focus on a very small area of a physical system, so that we don't have to look at the entire system performance. Maybe this can also help with the computational challenge. Thank you. I think we'll take other questions. Can you? Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Um, Dr. Odku asks, I would like to ask how about how your day head approach could be extended towards more innovative applications of vehicle to grid technologies. Uh, so I think I can. So you are asking uh, how we can innovatively improve it, extend it to vehicle to grid technologies. Uh, how no, what how we can extend it to grid technologies? Vehicle to grid. Vehicle. Uh, V two G. Never. Never mind. Uh, V two G, V two G. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. Um. Okay. Good question. Um. Uh, so for V two G, uh, good question. So for V two G, so uh, yeah. Th there another uh, major trend, uh, major change to the power system is uh, uh, you know, integ integration of a large number of electric vehicles that will also create uh, you know, challenges to grid operations and the stability. Um, so, uh, this uh, to address uh, that challenge, I think we'll need to uh, we we'll need to have some uh, program like a demand response program, uh, so that we have we may be able to, we can have a, uh, like a, a EV aggregators so they can you know, better uh, utilize and control EVs because EV. Uh, from the power grid perspective, EVs, they are essentially batteries. They, they do charge, discharge. Uh, for EVs, they mainly do, do charge. Uh, yeah, they mainly do, do charge. Uh, but with proper control and, uh, uh, pre uh, and the proper uh, market uh, pricing mechanism, we may be able to uh, uh, attract EV owners to participate in some demand response programs so they may be able to offer 
you know, uh, ancillary service like they we can use their EV batteries to provide it, uh, to provide additional uh, support to the grid. Uh, so how that is related to this work? Um, so you, as I mentioned, for uh, EV batteries, they are like inverter based uh, resources, right? Uh, with the proper control, they can provide a virtual inertia. Uh, and uh, if we can leverage uh, a large number of EVs uh, uh, and uh, let, let them provide uh, virtual inertia, so then we, you know, we can uh, better in, uh, improve the, the system, the grid uh, dynamic performance. Okay, yeah. thank you. That, that's one good question, thank you. Uh, we have a few more. Dr. Nina Govias asks, have you looked at the time delays for your predictions? Is it realistic for deployment? Uh, yeah, that's another uh, very important question. Um, so uh, for the machine learning uh, uh, model, right? So when we do the training, it will take a lot of time, but that is an offline process. Uh, so you know, the long training time won't affect the the uh, the the uh, the Train the machine learning performance, um, and the, and the, you know this kind of machine learn, learning models, right? Uh, compared to large language models like uh, you know, ChatGPT, they are they are much smaller. So uh, so their inference time is like an inst instant, like a milliseconds. Uh, so they are they are very quick. Uh, and also, as a, regarding delay, so the inference uh, time won't be cause any delay, but um, but uh, uh, we uh, but when, for the physical system performance, uh, there might be some delay. But we uh, but when we train the machine learning model, we can do a, a look a, a higher prediction. We can predict uh, you know um, the what the system would perform. Uh, with uh, with uh, uh, for uh, with uh, uh, with some uh, uh, expected or say predicted uh, uh, grid condition. Okay, thank you. Last question, Mira asks, what are the features used for predicting ROCOF? What is the uh, predict what ah? Uh, what are the features used for predicting the ROCOF? Uh, raw curve, rate of change of frequency. Uh, um, let me go back. Let's see. I probably don't have that information on my slide. Uh, so the input features for this model include the generator status. So uh, uh, while that generator is on or off, so there will be a, a binary input feature. Uh, an, another set of input features is the generator output power. So for offline generators, uh, they won't produce any electricity, so uh, they will be there. But for the online generators, they will uh, provide some uh, power, right? Uh, so, uh, th uh, so that will be some uh, continuous input features. And, uh, uh, and also we, another set of input features is the disturbance. A disturbance. If we go back, uh, when I show you the curve, so so this is the, uh, what, uh, what the system uh, would uh, change after a disturbance. So uh, of course we, we need to have the disturbance information as part of the input feature. Uh, so for for this work, uh, we have you know, these three sets of input features. Uh, this is for they had any scaling for this work. Um, but if we want to apply this work uh, uh, for, uh, in real time, we may be able to consider additional input features, such as you know, the voltage information, the relative power information. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee, for your great presentation and contributing to our webinar series. You'll be receiving you. an, uh, We'll be sending you a, a gift bag with a plaque and a certificate signed by our dean. Um, awesome. We'll be in touch. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Take care. Bye. You too.